Welcome to this Learn at Work webinar, a complimentary webinar sponsored by the Journal of Work, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation. I'm Karen Jacobs, the founding editor of Work, and I'll be the moderator today. I'm going to turn this over now to um, our speaker, and we have quite a few speakers today. So, Kimberly, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobs. We appreciate the opportunity to present today a win-win perspective on workplace accommodation, a Retain Kentucky Self-Advocacy Guide to Promoting Successful Return to and Stay at Work Outcomes for Workers with Disabilities. I am Kimberly Wickert, and we're gonna get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Um, our presentation is funded by a grant awarded by the United States Department of Labor and was created by the grantee and does not necessarily reflect the official position of the U.S. Department of Labor, and they make no guarantees, warranties, or assurances of any kind expressed or implied with respect to such information, including on linked sites, and, but not limited to accuracy of information or its completeness, timeliness, usefulness, adequacy, continued availability, or ownership. This product is copyrighted by the institution that created it. Our objectives today are to review the provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act that require employers to provide workplace accommodations for people with disabilities and present a win-win procedure for workers as well as their employers to be able to identify and implement those reasonable accommodations. We're also going to describe accommodation and universal design resources that can aid rehabilitation and health professionals in providing return to work and stay at work services for individuals with disabilities. So as I mentioned, my name is Kimberly Wickert. I am a, um, my visual description is that I'm a mid-career white female with blonde hair and glasses. And um, I, my preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a certified rehabilitation counselor. So to any of you who are listening live today, um, my fellow CRC's Happy National Rehabilitation Counselor Appreciation Day today, March 22nd. Um, I'm also a certified vocational evaluator and um, am uh, part of the Retain Kentucky team at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kathy Shepard Jones, for her to introduce herself. Thanks, Kimberly. I am. Kathy Shepard Jones, and I am the Executive Director of the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. And we are Kentucky's University Center on Disability. For a visual description of me, I am a 50 something year old white woman with short brown and gray hair. Today I'm wearing a gray sweater dress and glasses. I'm also a power wheelchair user. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I use person first language when I describe my relationship with disability. I am also a certified rehabilitation counselor. Happy certified rehabilitation counselor day to all. And it is also uh, developmental disabilities awareness month. So happy developmental disability awareness month to everyone who's joining us. Thank you very much. And next we have Megan Balmonk, who is going to introduce herself. Good morning. Um, yes, I'm Megan Balmonk. I am a 30-something white female with blonde hair. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am wearing a white button-up shirt with um, some light brown glasses. And I am also a certified rehabilitation counselor and a PhD student with the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Megan, and welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here today as well. And we are going to round our group up with um, Dr. Phil Rumrell. Thank you, Kimberly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it may be. Uh, and welcome to everyone joining in. Dr. Jacobs, thank you for this opportunity to be here with the uh, uh, Learn at Work webinar. I'm, I'm Phil Rumrell, um, also a certified rehabilitation counselor on a rehab 
a, a counselor uh, by training. I'm the director of research in the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. Delighted to be here with my colleagues today. Uh, I am a 50 something uh, white male. Uh, my pronouns are he, his, and him. Today I'm wearing a red University of Arkansas uh, golf style shirt, a nondescript uh, background in the portable office uh, that I'm uh, in today. I have very little, if any, hair, hazel colored eyes. And uh, uh, that's all I would want to say about my appearance. So I'm uh, looking forward to uh, this opportunity and uh, we look forward to entertaining any questions or comments anybody might have, uh, you know, related to any of our remarks today. So thanks to one and all. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and um, have you get us started, Dr. Rumrell, with um, Title I of the ADA. Thank you. Well, the impetus for our win-win approach to reasonable accommodations, and indeed much of what we do in our Retain Kentucky program, centers on the civil rights provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA, as many of you know, is the most comprehensive civil rights law for people with disabilities, uh, is the most comprehensive civil rights law for people with disabilities in the history of the world, uh, first signed into law in 1990. Uh, by President George H.W. Uh, Bush, amended in 2008 by President George W. Bush. And Title I of the ADA, and this is not by accident that Title I focuses on employment. It's the first and primary uh, provision, just like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title I centers on employment. And very much like the Civil Rights Act, this is a civil rights law for people with disabilities. Title I of the ADA prohibits employers from discriminating against qualified people with disabilities in 41 distinct areas of behavior and personnel actions. So this ranges from making it unlawful for employers to harass, to intimidate people with disabilities. The terms and conditions of employment may not be unfair or inequitable to a worker with a disability. Uh, decisions regarding uh, uh, promotion, layoff, termination, discipline, the benefits and terms and conditions of employment have to be uh, uh, equitable for, for all workers. And people with disabilities have the civil right uh, to complain and to have unfair treatment adjudicated uh, should they encounter discrimination in the workplace. Uh, and these areas of employment are very similar to what occurs in Title I of the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Workplace Protections for People with Disabilities. So the ADA is a, is, is a big deal. But the ADA does one thing that the Civil Rights Act does not, and it entitles qualified workers with disabilities to reasonable accommodations that allow them to perform the essential functions of their jobs provision that was added to the ADA that really separates it uh, and provides a protection for people with disabilities that is not available to other protected classes under the 1964 law. Essentially, though, all decisions, everything in the Human Resources Manual has to be implemented and overseen, and any changes that are made have to be done without regard to the existence or consequence of disability. So in making decisions, the employers, uh, the onus on the employer is to uh, uh, demonstrate that the decision is made without regard to the person's uh, disability, except the accommodation provision, which centers on the person's disability. And so this becomes important as we, um, as we move forward. Uh, the Title I of the ADA also entitles workers with disabilities who have been discriminated against to remedies uh, to redress uh, the, the violation of their civil rights. And these can include um, uh, court orders or injunctions for the employer to stop discriminatory practice, hiring, reinstatement, um, uh, rest or a back pay, uh, punitive and compensatory uh, damages, and they are limited, punitive and compensatory damages, are limited to $300,000 per person, uh, actually per discriminatory event under Title I of the ADA. But prior to 1990, if a person with a disability was mistreated in the workplace, there were no 
uh, there was there was literally no recourse where they could get any individual satisfaction from that. So this has been a big deal for more than 30 years now. The United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces Title I of the ADA at the federal level. So I mentioned a couple times the qualifier qualified. And Kimberly, if we go on to the next slide, this just describes what who's covered, who is protected by Title I of the ADA. And the ADA protects qualified individuals who have physical or mental impairments that substantially limit functioning in one or more major life activities. The major life activity uh, can include, but does not have to be uh, working. Um, it can be other areas, uh, just for example, a long COVID uh, syndrome since September of 2022 is now considered a presumptive disability for protection under Title I of the ADA. So if you have long COVID, you cannot be discriminated against on that basis by a covered employer. This is another uh, big deal uh, in civil rights uh, law and, and practice. So a person who actually has a disability is, of course, protected under Title I of the ADA, but the ADA goes a little farther than that. And it says that employers may not discriminate against a person who has a record of a disability. So you don't have to have a current disability, but they can't discriminate you on the basis of a past or previous um, disability. Becomes very interesting and a very important protection. The employer may also not discriminate against you based on their perception that you are a person with a disability. So regarded as having a disability provides protection as well. So people who don't have disabilities but are thought to have them by their employer and the employer takes actions that are based on those assumptions, that's also illegal. May also not be discriminated against on the basis of your association or relationship with a person with a disability. Family member, friend, associate of any kind, employers cannot treat you unfairly on that basis alone. Important qualification though, as it applies to reasonable accommodations in the workplace, we call those three definitions, the um, uh, record of, regarded as, and associate of person with a disability. We call those the alternate prong definitions because they don't refer to the person themselves having a disability. Um, the prong definitions do not apply to reasonable accommodations. So reasonable accommodations in the workplace are um, granted only to people who have actual and current disabilities. We'll go on to the next slide. Reasonable question. Okay, that's who's protected. Now who is covered? What employers are required uh, to participate in the ADA's non-discriminatory uh, uh, employment provisions? Well, most all uh, private and public employers with 15 or more uh, employees are covered employers under Title I of the ADA. Exempted from the ADA are um, our Native American tribes, uh, the federal government, and private membership clubs that do not pay federal taxes. That's an important qualifier there. Um, but for the most part, um, most every employer with 15 or more uh, employees is required to participate in Title I of the ADA. And when we say participate, what we mean is not discriminate against, against workers with disabilities. Um, you're probably wondering why the federal government, you know, has exempted itself from the federal provisions of the ADA. And if your employer is the federal government or a federal contractor or a program receiving federal funds, um, and you have a disability, you would be protected under Title V of the Rehabilitation Act. And that's outside the purview of this presentation, but Title V, Sections 501 through 508 of the Rehabilitation Act are the civil rights provisions of that law. And so for around uh, 50, almost 50 years, exactly 50 years actually, um, the federal government has been requiring itself um, to treat workers with disabilities um, fairly under the basis of a different law. So the federal government uh, determined there was no need to include them under Title I of the ADA. And really that ends my brief overview of Title I. I'll turn it back over to, I think, to you, right? Absolutely, thank you so much.
we're going to go ahead and move on and talk about common areas of work limitations. So um, you can see on this slide here where um, an inaccessible workstation may be um, uh, an, a limitation for someone. And we've seen individuals um, in retain who, um, Dr. Rumrell used the example of long COVID, um, who have had long COVID and um, have lingering uh, fatigue and, and duration um, limitations. So getting to their workstation, if it is, you know, um, a distance from where they park or where they get dropped off could be a limitation or even, you know, a common copy area or cafe. Um, that could be uh, a, a limitation as well. You can see physical barriers um, that we have listed here. Some of those may be um, just uh, maps that are used as you come in to uh, a building. Another limitation could be operating equipment or technology. The work environment is one that we see often as well. And um, I just was, um, made aware of an example with someone uh, this week about um, dust and fumes. So you can see examples listed here, temperature and lighting, but dust and fumes can often be um, an, an environmental limitation as well. Strength and stamina, um, we think of the physical demands of a job, you know, lifting, pushing, pulling, carrying, motor coordination so that could come into play for somebody who is using um, fine motor skills for keyboarding or speech we see sensory listed here as well as cognitive and mental health limitations so specific to reasonable accommodations the ada requires reasonable accommodations as they relate to three areas of employment. And those would be ensuring equal opportunity for individuals as they are applying for jobs in that process, as well as enabling a qualified individual who has a disability to perform the essential functions of a job. And the third one is um, making it possible for an employee with a disability to enjoy equal benefits and privileges of that employment. Categories of reasonable accommodations that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission suggests are listed here. And you could see that restructuring are um, the two first listed. One of those is of existing facilities. So um, looking at accessibility specific to um, restrooms or um, getting into the building or then being able to move around the building as well once you're in the building. But we also want to look at restructuring of a job if that is possible um, with an individual. Change in work location has been something that we all are very much aware of over the last several years. Um, and so telecommuting and home-based work may be um, something that would be continued as a reasonable accommodation. We can look at modification of work schedules as well, um, reducing hours, maybe working a different shift. Um, as an accommodation for individuals or flex time. Some individuals may request a reassignment to another position as a reasonable accommodation, and this would be a vacant position, and we need to be sensitive to um, union and seniority rules and not violate those. And we usually exhaust that um, as a, a last um, option. We talk about modification of equipment, and um, oftentimes we can look at assistance with lifting. Um, this example is on an assembly line and a lift hook. We can see that um, in healthcare settings as well. We often see um, Hoyer lifts where uh, healthcare workers can use that to, to help lift patients and, and modify um, their job and um, other equipment that they're using. 
installation of new equipment such as um, app applications, smartphone apps can be used, voice activation. Um, we often see utilization of large monitors as equipment requests as well. And then provision of qualified readers or interpreters could um, fit into that category of reasonable accommodations. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Shepard Jones. Thanks, Kimberly. I'm going to talk now and give some examples of accommodations for job functions and related disability factors. And of course, these are just some examples. You may hear these and have other ideas as well, but uh, these are the ones that we're going to be using today. And the first one, Kimberly, has actually already alluded to. The disability factor that's at play here is around muscular and pulmonary weakness that have occurred secondary for an employee who has long COVID. And the job function that we're discussing is around entering a place of business to an employee's workstation. So when we're considering this disability component, a possible accommodation and way to address this job function around being able to get to one's workstation would be to ensure, first of all, that the workstation is close to the entrance to allow for a shorter traverse. Also, ensuring that the path to the workstation is free and clear of obstacles or hazards, and that means no trip hazards, like the extension cord for the vacuum that might be laying across the entrance. That means not having stacks of inventory or pallets in the hallway that can impede a person's access to a workstation. Let's get rid of the giant fake ficus tree that gets in the way for everyone. And along with that would be ensuring that the individual employee has accessible parking available to them. And that needs to be in close proximity to the building. That could also mean um, helping that person with the process to acquire an accessible hang tag if that's needed. Our next example for potential accommodation around a job function is related to production line work. And so in this case, the employee has anxiety and the anxiety is exacerbated or made worse by extremes in temperature around heat. So possible accommodations here, uh, are there's also a variety. If temperature is cooler in the building at certain times of the day, we might think about moving this person's shift, maybe third shift when temperatures in the building have dropped. We could also consider adding a fan to the working area if there isn't one there already or having the person's location be close to the cooling unit that is on that production line. We could also consider more frequent breaks for the employee to be able to access water to apply ice or that would enable the person to relocate to a temperature control break room. And maybe that would happen more frequently. So perhaps that would be a five minute break every hour as opposed to a more typical break schedule that is traditionally used by a company. And along with that, another potential accommodation and really an application of assistive technology design would be to consider clothing that is intended to be cooling as well. And that clothing addresses those physiological changes and increases in body temperature and has um, smart thermodynamic properties. And there really are some pretty, um, pretty cool options out there. No pun intended. All right, the pun was intended, but I'll go on. Uh, so some other examples to consider. Uh, let's, let's think about clerical tasks and how to keep organized. This is for an employee who is experiencing some uh, cognitive uh, memory deficits. So the assistive technology that's used here truly can level the playing field by aiding in performing a task that would otherwise be difficult for a person with a disability to accomplish. In this case, we're considering organizational and task management needs and the compensatory strategies that can help this employee to be successful. And the tools that help us stay organized are much more available recently and are in fact built in to a lot of the software 
that we're using. And a really good example of this is the Microsoft suite of products. There are to-do reminders that are available that can cue someone for activities that need to happen throughout the day. There are task lists. You can set reminders. You can dismiss reminders. You can set a reminder to remind you again. There are so many different options and organizational helpers that are out there. It really can come down to what uh, preferences of the individual as well. So it's nice to have some choices on uh, knowing what the preferences are and what the needs are around that tool. Um, but again, really the fact that so many of them are already built in to existing software that we're already using, it makes for some very nice and easily accessible and usable options for people and employees that could also be uh, strategically used across employees as well. That's a great example of universal design. Uh, the next one that I want to mention is around a job where an individual employee is providing case management services and that person has a reactive airway disease. And in this scenario, the person's breathing may be impacted by a variety of environmental exposures. And if the person is able to provide those case management services virtually and work out of the way of those uh, ex exposure to triggers, that may make it a, a much more beneficial work situation for someone. And that could lead to provision of those case management services virtually. That might be uh, remotely. That could be uh, telecommuting, as Kimberly mentioned, or it could be in another employment setting within the workplace as well. So when we're talking about accommodations, we must also talk about circumstances that can create undue hardship. And if an accommodation is found to be an undue hardship, it's not feasible because it's either unduly expensive, extensive, or disruptive to the workplace. So what we need to ask is, is the accommodation more costly than another equally effective strategy. Undue hardship may also come in play if an accommodation requires extensive physical renovations of a space that can disrupt business. And in addition, if the accommodation affects other staff or customers negatively, it could also be considered an undue hardship. If any of these situations apply, an employer isn't required to make the accommodation but it is very much a case-by-case -case basis as well, because what could be considered an undue hardship for one employer may not be for another. And one example here, uh, if, if we think about um, two desk chairs, both of them provide the needed support for the employee. Both have similar ergonomic design. Both have been recommended but one is $400 and the other is $40,000. That's, uh, that, that's a really, um, I think, a straightforward example, um, but it also does um, highlight that case-by-case uh, that -case situation and the fact that the most expensive option does not need to be the one that's chosen. Okay, so why are we doing all of this in the first place? And the next slide gives an excellent list of reasons why. And of course, as Dr. Rumrow mentioned, it is under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the law. We also know that in general, people like to work with employers and businesses that accommodate workers who happen to have disabilities and workers with disabilities are part of the whole diversity, equity, and inclusion area for work as well. Disability is an inherent and embedded component of DEI in the workplace. In addition, a great resource, the Job Accommodation Network, also known as JAN, tells us still that most accommodations cost nothing and many accommodations cost around $500 when you look at the whole breadth and scope of accommodations that are provided in the workplace. And when we make accommodations, 
many of them can improve the safety of the workplace as a whole for everyone. Many accommodations also promote universal design, as I mentioned with the example around using uh, reminders with the Microsoft suite of products. And universal design really sets a stage for us to make all of our places and spaces and our policies and our resources as usable and accessible to the, to the variety of people that may interact with them as possible. So that means that it's better for all of our workers, it's better for all of our customers. And along with that, we're also promoting a combination of strategies that give us the ingredients for workplaces that are truly inclusive and promote a sense of belonging for everyone. Um, if you also uh, prefer another good reason, um, costs around reasonable accommodations are also tax deductible for employers. And I mentioned Jan, um, that is one example of national level resources that are available to be used. And the website for Jan is askjan.org. Lots of data there um, that are found on the slide as well. Workers who use accommodations are found to be more satisfied, more productive, and more likely to remain in employment than when we do not use accommodations in the workplace. And that means less turnover. And for employers, that turnover issue is huge. We want to keep our valued employees. And particularly, as we know that there is a current uh, labor shortage nationally, we've got to do everything that we can to keep our employees productive uh, and effective in an inclusive workplace. Thank you very much. So the win-win approach to reasonable accommodations was developed for the National MS Society in 1992 and has been regularly updated since then. Um, the win-win approach begins at the uh, begins when the worker discloses their disability status to the employer, and until that disclosure is made, the reasonable accommodations um, they can't start until that disclosure is made. So to start this process, we we like to encourage that friendly, interactive dialogue with the employer, and we see that as the most effective way to arrange reasonable accommodations. Rehabilitation and health professionals um, and other advocates can guide the worker and the employer through this interactive process, um, wherever the worker may want that additional support. And we want to avoid the formal and legalistic language, that jargon, um, to every extent possible. We don't want to bring up, um, you know, that it is the law before we need to. Really starting those conversations, we can focus on enhancing productivity um, and continuing success instead of emphasizing health-related problems or work limitations, and we emphasize that mutual benefit um, of reasonable accommodations for both the employee and the employer, that true win-win when the employee stays employed. On the Win-win approach, we have some recommended steps, and this starts with requesting an in-person meeting with the supervisor or the HR director in the organization. And this would depend on who the organization says um, is the correct person to go to, so that may vary. Stating that you want to discuss your accommodation needs and emphasizing your desire to be even more productive on the job. If your employer doesn't already know, um, you state that you have a disability, um, you do not have to go into details if that isn't comfortable for you. Um, you can leave it at that you have a disability. 
it's important to specify the duties or the specific tasks that you wish to discuss. And rather than focusing on the difficulties that you're having performing the job, um, emphasizing how the accommodations implemented would enable you to continue to work productively. We would want to cite the accommodations that you've identified as effective, um, finding those oftentimes on JAN that we mentioned, stating how the accommodation would benefit your job performance, and describing the resources uh, available to assist in implementation of the accommodations and the nature of the resource, um, thinking about financial assistance, assistive technology programs, and JAN, that accommodation, uh, job accommodation network, and then state what you think the approximate cost will be. Then, after all that, we ask for agreement from the employer and respond with affirming statements. Um, will this work for you? Great, I appreciate it. After this, we restate the agreement and we clarify personal responsibilities and professional responsibilities from the employer. And closing the interaction with a positive statement about the accommodation arrangements and your appreciation for the employer's time and assistance. And then we want to monitor the ongoing effectiveness of the accommodations that are implemented and follow up with accommodations if they're not implemented. Um, typically, we recommend a 10 day window to follow up if things haven't been implemented and recognizing that accommodations may need some improvement. They may not be perfect, but giving it some time um, to figure out if they are effective and update as needed. It's important to note that rehabilitation and health professionals can be involved throughout this process, um, providing support, encouragement, technical assistance, and even referrals to those accommodation resources. As we guide individuals through the accommodation process, um, workers may be reluctant to advocate for themselves. This might stem from a lot of different areas, um, but sometimes we just need to uh, be encouraging of advocating for themselves. The rehabilitation and health professionals can support workers in the discussions with employers or discuss accommodations with employers um, on the worker's behalf, whichever the worker chooses and however they may um, feel the most support. We need to identify the best employer contact for the accommodation planning, who's the most appropriate point of contact or the decision maker. We don't want to overuse the toolkit and we keep it with this least intervention principles. We don't over accommodate and we don't um, ask for too many accommodations that may not be used, right? So we only use the support um, that the worker needs. And the role of healthcare providers and um, health, mental health partners, they can help in that accommodation, uh, the return to work and the stay at work processes. Support in the accommodation process. Um, some workers may need support to identify their accommodation needs. They may not know what is out there or what would be the most effective. So accommodation planning can be done um, concurrently with other return to work and stay at work services. Workers have the, ref the right to refuse any or all accommodations. If something's not working, they don't have to accept the accommodation. And I think it's really important to think about trauma-informed care during this process. Um, we're not making assumptions that trauma is inherent to disability um, or everyone with disabilities have experienced trauma, but trauma-informed care can help us understand uh, more about the impacts of trauma in the phases of service delivery. And we, recognize that the prevalence of trauma is higher in populations with disabilities when compared to non-disabled populations. And there may not always be full awareness of um, connections between 
past trauma and current issues. So when we start having these conversations about accommodations, it can be extremely stressful and at times traumatic. And if we come into the conversation with a trauma-informed lens, um, we can be more prepared and operate in good faith with the win-win approach. Thank you very much, Megan, for all of that information. We also have some um, resources listed here, um, many of which we've, we've talked about, um, including the Job Accommodation Network. Um, several of us are at the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute, so you can find resources there as well as the ADA Center's National Network, the State Voc Rehab programs and assistive technology industrial associations. With that, we would like to thank you all for uh, joining us today. You can contact us, um, Dr. Rumrell at philip.rumrell at uky.edu. And Dr. Jacobs, I don't know if there are any questions in the question or chat box but we're happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. Um, you know, I'm an occupational therapist and um, Phil and I had the opportunity to also um, work with, with Jan and this all pulled together and I love um, the integration of case studies it really made it come alive. And I think for many, many people listening um, as well. Um, I don't see questions in the chat, but let me just reach out to the attendees. Um, if you have questions, please put it in, in the chat um, for us as well. So you really updated a better understanding of the ADA and the importance of really knowing your rights. And, and um, the resource of the Job Accommodation Network, I think, was was wonderful for that as as one resource are there others that you know besides what you're doing that you recommend um individuals who are who are in the healthcare field that are working with individuals and people in general employers that they should make sure they have um on the top of their list um to go yeah to. that's a great question Absolutely. I would say as an individual, as well as an employer, you can find additional information um, at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission website. They um, list frequently asked questions um, that employers might have, that workers might have, and I think those would help answer healthcare providers' questions as well. And I think from um, a worker perspective as well as a healthcare provider and an employer perspective, it's important to note that um, an em employee or an individual does not have to formally um, request the interactive process or interactive discussion. Them sharing information with the employer about, um, you know, their disability or limitations should um, start that conversation. It doesn't have to be formal in nature. Oh, that's really helpful to know. So that's federal. Um, on a local level, you know, Massachusetts, Kentucky, um, and other states, is there, you know, a state base that people should look at as a resource? I would say um, starting with their state vocational rehabilitation agency would always be a, a great place to start um, to learn about local support and their vocational rehabilitation counselors would be able to guide them through that process as well. Great, great. Um, thank you, thank you for, for that. Um, in your experiences now, and this can be for your whole whole team as well, um, are you finding people who have long COVID availing themselves and knowing about the ADA? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's something to add to that, but I would say um, I I have not seen a direct connection with individuals that we work with at Retain thinking of themselves as being a qualified individual under ADA. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't know, Megan, have you had any experience that? I haven't seen anything personally with long COVID. I have seen um, similar issues with other emerging disabilities, but not specifically long COVID. Yeah, thank you. You know, I think and I hope that people listening to um, this webinar on our YouTube channel um, will become more aware of this because I have to say I try to keep up with everything and I have not seen that. So maybe another mm -hmm. thing that we could do is have something written for the work journal um, about this so that people are much more aware that they may be eligible um, under the ADA. Absolutely. The participants that we've seen at Retain are really kind of still in the thick of um, you know, dealing with their symptoms and trying to overcome the barriers to stay at work or return to work. So maybe haven't gotten to that point yet where they're, you know, thinking um, about resources and support. And that's where we come into play. But when we first start working with them, that's not something that they um, generally know about or are, are thinking about until we help educate them on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I think this is something, you know, we're in a new a new normal now and trying to see, you know, how we can best serve clients with long COVID um, is really, really important. Um, before we conclude, are there any last thoughts you'd like to share um, with our listeners? You put together such a fabulous, informative presentation. I didn't know if you had any last thoughts you'd like to share. I would just say that, um, you know, having worked with individuals in this situation, and, and Megan talked about it in her portion, um, you know, it can be very emotional asking for an accommodation, um, especially if it's somebody who's had a recent onset of a disability or maybe even an exacerbation of a disability. So um, the win-win approach really kind of helps guide step-by-step -step and, and script the process for someone so that um, they can work through that process while they're still dealing with you know the emotions of of that and i would also say that um, accommodations don't only help that individual who's asking for them but we also see that they help other workers and um, increase productivity and safety across the board so when we say it's a winning approach, it's a winning approach for that individual who's asking for that accommodation. It's a winning approach for their coworkers because their coworkers are able to, to keep that person, um, you know, as a valued worker um, with them. And the employer is able to keep that person as a valued worker and often, you know, keep other people in a position that is more safe um, or increases safety as well. I love that statement. You know, we're we're all in it together, um, and I think thinking about our coworkers um, are is very very important. So thank you for that that statement. Um, I'm really impressed with the win-win, and I hope others will listen, to it, read your journal article as well, um, and see how they can apply it. Uh, to their own workplace and with the people they serve. So thank you so much. Thank you. So we're, oh, you're welcome. We're going to conclude this um, Learn at Work webinar. And I want to thank you and your team um, for being with us and, um, and also for the people who attended uh, live this uh, webinar. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay thank healthy. You.